then we get to the the point where they send me out to skin. Uh, I go out with the platoon or a battalion minus out there, and um, you know we're going on every mission. Ray and I, and uh, I had not worked directly with Ray in the same brigade back in the 14th, but he wasn't assigned to uh, an ETAC, and I didn't have a dedicated one charter for at the time. So I said, you can come with me, man, if he wants to. And the kid was just, you know, he, he was like me. He was older. He came in when he was older. So he was very mature. He was already a very driven young man, very quiet. I knew he was married. I knew that his wife was pregnant uh, and going to have a little, another little girl. And they were, you know, struggling as young couples do with deployments and being separated and whatnot. And he was, he would call every now and then on the sat phone, talk to her. He was good. I never had to babysit Ray. I never had to worry about the radios not being, the batteries being charged or the meals ready to go. Or he was always fast packing stuff. He was on, he was on the wads all the time. He, this kid was strapped and it was his birthday and he had turned 24, I think it was 24, I think, I think, I think, I think. But um, he had turned 24, we got started taking indirect fire, uh, artillery fire from Afghan, uh, Pakistan. We had, a, there was a Taliban leader called Muhammad, who had a fire base just across the border. Mm -hmm. And you could see the flash. We get in the Delta Tower, we had a, a nice camera up there and a nice 50 cal mounted. We had our little degrees on the walls and stuff and you could mm -hmm. see out in the original about seven clicks out it looked like and um you see a flash and about 45 seconds later we, we, we take rounds and they're pretty accurate they pepper the yeah. walls they if they landed inside definitely they're going to hit something whether mm -hmm. it's equipment or someone else but, but luckily no one ever got hit but we would always get harassing fire um we went out the next day after his birthday, we went to like Malakase, Mangrate, kind of up that area along the border because we known it was no, you know, well known border crossing areas. You know, mm -hmm. they were coming across the border into those villages where they were storing weapons or whatever munitions. We we go up there and talk to the locals, and Ray would always hit it off with the kids. He'd always have some kind of candy to give to them talk to him, take pictures with him. And he was very personable. Uh, the day we got hit on his birthday, I'll back up. Um, he and I, we run up in the Delta Tower and I'm in, you know, we're in PT gear and um, we get up there. I've got the 117 Fox and um, Ray's calling Tombstone to try to get Cass. And I'm like, you know, we can put it up. We'll see. We can get some cast, but it's it's in Pakistan. We're not we're not going to go after anything in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I said, but you know, it's your birthday. We'll put a put a request up, see if we can get something. So we got a ten that showed up, and I said, you need to start working up nine lines. And as we're taking these rounds, before the, the plane showed up, Ray is on the back side of the tower, like where rounds would come into easily. I'm up against the front wall, sandbags. So if anything comes, it's going to hit the sandbags or fall behind me. Right. And Ray's just in, 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 when you hear rounds coming down like that, dude, that, that sound, dude, it's like, Ooh, it's, it's scary, especially when they come close and, uh, he's ducking down and trying to get back on the radio and, you know, drops the antenna and picks it back up, puts it back on the wall and he's shaking and I just grab him and put him underneath me and pull him front. To the front of the tower and I'm looking down at him I can still see his eyes looking at me he's like I'm scared I'm like well I'm like brother I'm scared too I said but you're doing a good job I said you're doing your job man I said you're crushing it I said get us that air and he just kept doing his thing we had a 10 check on station and um, so I did the fire fight and I said look you know I'm not gonna send you over there I said but I have some NIIs that I want you to look at but I'm gonna have my one Charlie four work you around the area i said mm -hmm. you know, in, in, unless you get called for something i said that's all the work i got for you i said plus it's his birthday he goes Shh, tell him i'm ready whenever he is and he really got to control that day and i remember nice. i could see him like he was walking off the tower walking down the stairs and i said ray he turned around and i said 
happy birthday, dude. How you like the fireworks? And he goes, I didn't like those fireworks on Blackwell. <laughs> and uh, I said, you did a good job, dude. You did a really good job. But uh, Skin was cool. We we went on every mission that we uh, they had, every mission. Uh, we did not rest at all. And um, so we, we get back from a night mission where we're along the border up on an OP. Ray and I with with a sniper up on the OP, this little bitty ranger guy, and the gun has got to be taller than the guy standing. It's got to be. This dude is carrying this cannon, this artillery piece around like it's right. a Beretta. This dude is a tough dude. Mm -hmm. He went up that mountain so many times carrying that thing. This dude was just, and I was smoked. I get to the top of this OP and I'm sweating and I'm like, now I'm cold. <laughs> Luckily, nothing ever happened. And we, so we had to walk back, get back to the fob. And I go, I say, I'm going to go check in the talk and uh, see if things going on. And so I go in the talk, come back and race, putting batteries on charge. He's got meals repacked and stuff. And um, then the talk, talk in seal runs in. He goes, hey, we've got dismounts. At a cache site, uh, commander needs you in the talk now. So I go in the talk. Captain Trey hands in there. He goes, Lee, we're going to send a QRF out to the to the border. Uh, to and he's got the rate camera up. We see all these uh, you know military age men uh, armed, RPGs, RPKs, AKs. Just I mean, they're just loaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's basically said, we're going to go find out what they're up to. So we load up seven or eight vehicles. We didn't have a lot of up armor vehicles, but we had uh, a couple. And um, it felt like we were a bunch of rednecks going to go hunt a deer because there was gun barrels sticking out every window. <laughs> you know, we were we were in a turtle Humvee crammed in and uh, no room whatsoever. Um, so we get to the, the border and we're going down to the wadis. We're getting back up on this ridge. And we dismount, and I'm walking to my left. Ray had just got out of the vehicle. I said, radio up? He goes, yeah, Ray, radio's up. We're walking to the FSO and the, the commander. And all of a sudden, it's just like the entire side of the mountain in front of us just started shooting at us. Uh, grenades, they were lobbing grenades at us. RPGs were being shot at us. And I'm saying 20 feet away. I mean, they're just, and there's no, there's nowhere to hide. There's not a bush. There's not a rock. There's vehicles to hide behind. Uh, but a lot of those aren't up, up on her. They're soft skin. Yeah. No doors on them. And uh, so we hit the ground. I've, I'm probably 15 feet from Captain Trahan, FSO, and I'm looking for cover. And uh, I turned to Ray. I said, Call Tombstone, tell him troops in contact, 1972 enable. He goes, Roger that. So he starts going through the radio, doing his thing. And I looked to my far right, and I saw an up armor vehicle with 50 cal on top. And the dude is shooting straight down. That's how close the dudes are to us. And uh, they can hear the snaps and the whizzing. And it's just like really, really, really intense. And then I look in front of me and I see this guy on the other side of the ridge line of the wadi he leans out from behind a boulder he's got an RPG on the shoulder and he shoots it right and it cooks off right between Ray and I and it's like I look at him he looks at me I'm like holy oh, that is that's intense and I'm like okay we got it we got to we got to get out of this location this is you can hear guys getting shot. Guys are screaming. Guys are cussing. Guys are mad and shit. They're getting shot. Uh, guys are crying. It's just chaotic. And it's no over there. It's covered. So I said, grab the ruck. I have an antenna. He goes, what? I said, we're moving. Let's go. And we started running. It was like running in mud, dude. Like running in molasses. I could not get there fast enough. So I get there, fall down behind the back of the vehicle, and I start patting Ray down. And I said, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, just making sure you're not shot. I said, you need to check me. So we, we did that. You good? I'm good. You good? I'm good. So we low crawled up by the front passenger tire. 
I am directly beside the tire. Ray is directly beside me. And I'm looking right over the ridge line. I can see dudes trying to get back into Pakistan, running from boulder to boulder, hiding, trying to get back into Pakistan. Above us, there's a checkpoint, Pakistani checkpoint. I can see them looking down on us. Uh, north of me, probably a click at least, is the main border checkpoint when we were just out a couple days before. So I'm making sure nothing, I don't hear anything coming from that direction. And uh, I'm just kind of scanning. Okay, okay, I'm looking east. All right, it's going to be north to south, south to north, reciprocal, no east to west, or reciprocal, because I can't go into Pakistan and back. So it's going to be north and south, south to north. Right. It's going to be a show of force. So he, he's, he goes, we got fighters. And I said, okay, call sign, ETA, tell me something. He, mm -hmm. he goes, all right, stand by. So at that moment, the 50 gunner is standing above me now. So I wanted to tell the driver we were laying there. Because so I remember being in the JRTC years before. And we, the, the talk had jumped in the middle of the night. And you don't put your camo nets down. You just park your vehicles in the morning. You kind of fix things up. Well, we had jumped in the middle of the night. And I remember somebody had to go back to where we had jumped from to get the rest of the people to our location. And he drove over, over some people sleeping in their sleeper bags. He didn't wake up his ground guide to ground guide them out of the Italian area, the talk area. And um, so I remember, that's what I was thinking when I was sitting in Afghanistan, looking over the edge beside a vehicle. I was like, I need to tell the dude I'm laying here. Because I don't want him driving over me. One, I'm going to lose, lose my cover if I need it. Two, I want this dude to kill me. So I stand up, and I remember going to open up the driver's the passenger front door, but the window was down. You don't ever leave the windows down and I'm armory blew them up. So I opened up the back door, took some shots at the door, 50 gunners just cussing away, just get some, get some. It's like just yelling and brass is coming down. You had that smell. I yelled inside the door at the driver. I said, you got two guys right by the front tire. If you need to leave, lay on the horn and we'll get in. He goes, Roger that. And Ray yells at me, and he said, "Blue zero three in five minutes." So now, now I got a Danish F sixteen, Norwegian Danish EPAF F sixteen. So I got a language barrier. I got two GBU twelves. I got an air to air gun and an AIM nine. It's not going to help me. It's going to be a show of force. Right, right. So the last thing I told Ray was, "Stay behind your ruck. You'll be fine." In that instant, the 50 gunner gets shot in the forehead. And he falls. I thought he was dead. He falls, collapses inside the vehicle onto the ground. So I crawl in over this kid, roll him over, expect to see his head like just like a watermelon. And I roll him over, and he's, he's just trying to, he's blinking, and he's just trying to get his eyes to focus. The round had hit his Kevlar. The impact on the Kevlar hit his head. When it hit his head, it cut his forehead open. The edge of the, the Kevlar cut his forehead open. But he's fine. He just knocked out. And that's what I told him. The dude, you just got knocked the F out. He's like, I'm fine. And he's just trying to, I'm fine. Um, and then the driver, the windshield is just spider, man. It is nothing but, you can't see out of it. Yeah. And, um, He's screaming. He's got glass windshield shards in his face from the impacts on the windshield. Yeah. And he's like, get on the 50, get on the 50. I'm like, you get on the 50. I've got F-16s coming. So that time is when the door starts just banging into me. And I step down. And uh, I'm looking through the window of the door at Ray. And he's sitting back and he's holding his face. He's kicking the door. And I don't know that he's been shot right here. His whole lower jaw is gone. And blood's coming out like a faucet through his fingers. And, uh, dude, that was the most graphic and most violent thing I've ever seen in my life. And the, the look in his eyes was the most helpless 
and scared look I've ever seen in my life. It was it was it was bad, dude. Because I get to him, I go around the door, and I'm speaking in colorful language, obviously. I get on him, and uh, I tried to pull him back, drag him back behind the vehicle. And I kept falling down because, like, it's like sandy and gravelly, and he's heavy, and I'm heavy. And, well, you got all the gear. I kept falling down. I had no saliva in my mouth. It was so dry. It was unbelievable how hard it was to talk. Because I could not, I couldn't, it's like body fluids stopped working, you know. And uh, I get him behind the vehicle. And I tell him, I said, you got to help me, brother. And he's kicking the ground as I'm dragging him backwards. And I'm holding on to him now. And I'm screaming to my left because everybody's left of me. And uh, I'm screaming for the medic. And I know I got a bunch of dudes shot to shit. We got a lot of guys really shot up pretty bad. We have one medic. And I know I'm combat lifesaver qualified. I don't have a CLS bag. You know, something else I screwed up on. And um, I I felt helpless. I, I felt like I it's going to be my fault when he dies. And I uh, kept screaming for the medic. And then the vehicle starts backing up over me. And I'm holding Ray. I'm just holding him cradling him, looking down at him, talking to him, and I'm banging on the door, the back of the vehicle, and the guy gets out. out he goes, oh, shit. Because I had one point I had to lay right down to crawl forward to get the ruck, the radio, the antenna, our weapons, and drag them all back, pick Ray back up, got back on the radio, and I heard Blue Zero Three, because I could hear Blue Zero Three calling when the radio was still by the tire. So I crawled up, laid him down. I said, I'll be right back, brother. I got you. I mean, I, we got fighters coming. Just hold on, man. And uh, I look crawled up, drug everything back. I said, Blue Zero Three, Hard Work One One, stand by. I just put the mic down. I didn't worry about air, didn't, wasn't thinking about air, just worry about Ray. Because he's looking up at me, and he's pulling, he's clawing, he's just pulling at me. And blood is pouring like, like a faucet coming out. And there's like teeth, and there's bones, and there's flesh, and there's just shit all over me. It was really hard. It was really fucking hard. And, uh, it was hard. And, uh, kept screaming for the medic. I gotta get the medic here. And, uh, now he's not, he's not moving a lot. He's, I'm told, someone told me it was agonal breathing. What they call it, agonal breathing. It's when your body's fighting to stay alive, and, you know, fight to keep working. You'd have those gasps every now and then. And uh, I remember at one point, artillery starts coming down, 105s. And it's like, and it's in the ravine right in front of me, about 50 feet in front of me. The FO, Specialist Reed, probably Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Reed now, the dude is. He went SF. He's JTAC qualified, just an absolute stud now. But he's been hit by two grenades. It disabled his M4, and all he has is his mic. And he's calling an artillery. And he's smoking dudes. But he's putting them so close because that's how close they are to us. And I remember at one point, I grab, I'm holding Ray, and debris is coming down. And to hear multiple rounds and I mean multiple rounds of 105 coming in on you hear the impact the explosion and all that shit coming down on you dude I, I knew I was going to die I knew I was going to die it was it was unreal unreal and uh um at one point, it's the craziest thing in the world. I see two soldiers low crawl behind the back left side of the tire or the vehicle. One was a female, and I was just like, "What are you doing here?" It's just like, "I'm telling mom, you're you're in trouble." And she, I don't know, she was a driver or whatever. I, I don't know what, but they had a combat lifesaver back, and we started working on Ray, 
and I, I would not let him go. They were, they were trying to get me to lay him down. I wouldn't let him go. I said, you can have his arm. His arm is right there. And I would not let him go. I'm sorry. Um, so those two soldiers, man, they worked their ass off to help Ray. And they got an IV in him. I don't know how they did it. I couldn't do it. I, I tried and I tried. It was slippery. I didn't do a lot of that part because I was so covered in blood and I was super, everything was super slippery at the time. Yeah. It wasn't sticky yet. So we got IV in him and we, I said, let's put him in the vehicle. Let us put him in the vehicle. I said, I'll, I'll put him in the vehicle. And uh, so I laid him in the vehicle back to the Humvee. And uh, he's gone. And about that time, Captain Trahan, he got shot six times. Twice in each leg. Twice in one arm. One in the other arm. One went in. His cavalier came right back out. Um, Private Dennis got shot. A bunch of RTS got shot. The FO got shot. And they they were loading a bunch of guys up in a couple of like Toyota Hiluxes, a couple cargo Humvees and stuff, and they were leaving to my right, which is south, and they're going down the Wadi, crossing the, and going back to the fire base. But what we did not know was the insurgents were now flanking us. They were coming around the right, to our right, and they were going to flank us and come up behind us. So when they were doing that is when all the wounded loaded up the vehicles were going down the hill, so they opened up on vehicles full of wounded dudes. And that's when Private Dennis was running for cover and got shot in the butt. And it blew out his groin, his femoral artery. And it took us like seven hours to find him. Um, so at that point, Lieutenant Milan, the platoon leader, is yelling for everybody to fall back. We needed to regroup because we started. They hit us and we we're all spread out on top of the fridge line and we were taking ground effectively, but we weren't taking it together. Yeah. So we were going to start shooting across each other. So if we mm -hmm. fell back, regroup, took the ground effectively, we would be more effective. So we, f we fall back and I, I'm running. I got two weapons. I am from my chin to my toes. I am bright red and I'm got a radio and I'm calling blue zero three I got two weapons I got a tax set antenna I'm trying to hold up and run I sit down on the ground I sit next to Lieutenant Dolan the FSO he goes oh Jesus you're you're shot and I'm like no no it's not me it's Ray yeah. so Ray's gone and uh, I reached out to blue zero three and no response and so I tried again once I got established next to the FSO and nothing. I can hear him calling me. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. We, we got connection, but we don't have connection. All right, let's go secondary. So I went secondary secure, nothing. Went back to primary in the red, nothing. Secondary red, no. Green, red, nothing. Couldn't get him. I was really frustrated. Hmm. And the FSO... The radio's in the rock. I never even pulled it out, but so that RTO is helping me, and, and that's when I realized it was when the radio was shot that I could receive, but I couldn't transmit. Because what's happening now is Blue Bore Five Two is checking on with Blue Zero Three, Two A10s is checking on with the Two F16s, and I'm like, oh, thank God, man, A10s, yeah. and um, I'm sitting there next to Lieutenant Dolan. And the medevac has already landed at the fire base. The two Apaches that escorted it have pushed forward, Ace 1 1. So they push forward. And as I see them, and I can't talk to anybody, I hear Blue, Blue Zero 3 talking to Bore 5 2. They're talking to each other. And I'm like, wait a second. FSO has FM. He has cigars. Ace 1 1 has an FM. Bore has an FM. And all my little wheels inside my brain started. Okay, I think I, I can do this, and I just I said, sir, call X one one one. Tell him to call four five 
power of three, two. I was like, what? I'm like, tell the Apaches, call the A-10s. I need to talk to him. He's handing me his mic. He says, you can do it better than I can. He handed me his mic. And he says, that's your RTO. And it kid followed me around. And at one point during the skirmish, we had very sporadic fire. And uh, I had a total that day of eight Apaches. Um, at one point, six of them were around. I had four A-10s, two F-16s, two Harrys, and a B-1. And I didn't drop a bomb because we couldn't find private dentists. But I just I had to, no map, no nothing on a, on a fire's net. I said, okay, I've got to deconflict this. And I said, okay, what's, what's your min-max? What's your gun to target line? I pushed the fighters a thousand, a thousand feet above that. I pushed all the rear wing surface to 300 north of that gun to target line. So I had a, you know, impromptu, you know, airspace deconfliction and just started making shit happen. And, um, blue bore five, one checks on station and, uh, he checks on, he goes, hey, hard rock. This is bore confirmed. You're the non-rated ETAC. And I was like, they think I'm Ray. They think I'm dead. And Ray is here. Wow, mm -hmm. the system really worked. They sent a FAC A out here. I had an SF soft tack P, I was told, coming from Bagram to my location. All because everybody thought Ray was by, by himself and I was dead. Yeah. And uh, so the pot, I tell him, I said, no, I'm Hard Rock 1 1. 1 1 Bravo is down. I am 1 1 actual. He goes, stand by. And he calls back Tombstone. And eventually, Colonel Pope, who's in Ramadi in, F in Iraq, gets the word because he's been told I'm already dead. He's already been told I'm dead. Mm -hmm. And, well, at least that's at some point in this past 20 years, I've heard that. So I've yeah. attached that to it. I don't know how true that is. So let me first say that. Because um, right. as an old man, sometimes factual things are just what I thought things happened because I'm right. that freaking old. <laughs> but, um, you know, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Hard Rock 1-1 one, one actual. And he goes, after he came back, and he goes, what do you need? I said, I need you to maintain the stack. I said, I need you to run. And this is before type 1, 2, 3, BOC, BOT. This, not, this is all positive procedural control. Or so right. E-tax, it's all, hey, it's kind of, hey, man, I want you to control fixed wings. I'm going to talk to the rotary wings. I've got a lot of moving parts down here I need to keep an eye on. I need to show the forces, and I let them know when the air, the artillery was shut down and where the, art, the, the rotary was at. I, I can tell you what a B-1 looks like at about 1,000 feet. Um, some... Some amazing things happened in a very violent and very graphic situation. I couldn't have been with better dudes. It's like you wanted to pick a fight with these dudes that have been sitting on this fob for so many months and you've been shooting at them. You want to pick a fight with these dudes? These guys are ready. And they, yeah. they did an amazing job. They really, really did. Um, but what's been hard for me all these years is when we got back that night, we had a SF doc, I think he was from the University of Texas, because I was really, I was told after the, during the firefight, I was told Ray was, had made it back, and he's fine. At the end, we were back, the base of the uh, ridge line, we were all, where the, the ambush happened, and we were loading up, I was told that he didn't make it. And I was like, no, 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 bullshit, so-and-so told me, we, he's good. He's like, no, I didn't make it. And uh, so I was really having a tough time. I was, so then I got to a point in that seven hours where I got really, really sticky. Then I got, I had dry blood on me all day. Just, I was yeah. covered in it. I couldn't get it off me. I kept trying to wipe my hands in the, in the dirt. Couldn't stop seeing it. Couldn't stop seeing his eyes looking at me. There, there's a lot I cannot remember about that day as far as seeing those things. I know things happened, but I can't remember a lot of things. It's like my brain is no, you don't, you don't need to. It's not going to do you any good to remember what that looked like, you know. Right. And, and I'm thankful for that. But I, 
do just this last year i was hunting in georgia with my brother-in-law and we had we had caught a pig in the trap and he's going to kill it we had a 45 he's going to kill it no big deal we're going to skin it and uh he shoots the first time and the second time this thing is like t-rex man it's not going down and at one point he shoots it and everything from april 25th 2003 comes back everything because the sound of that pig was making trying to breathe shot through the face multiple times was exactly and i lost my shit dude i said i need to step away i'll be right back and i it, it's it's really really Every now and then, it, it grabs a hold of me, and it it really makes it hard. Yeah. Um, but I did nothing. I did nothing special. I, I I think I failed in a lot of ways that day. Um, I blame myself a lot for Ray uh, dying. I know that every one of my Techie brothers would have done a lot better than I would have done it. But all I can say is I did my best. And um, I wish it would not gone the way it did. And I, and I apologize. I jump around a lot. Um, it just kind of comes out sometimes that way. I yeah. think of certain things. But we got back to the fire base, and I and the 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 doc pulled me aside. He goes, "Leon, I want to I want to tell you something." And this dude, man, what what a great human being. He goes, "Lee, if I was laying beside you, and Ray was shot, he'd be dead." And there's no way I can save him. He's not going to make it. We got him stable, and he's on his way to Bogdan, so he's not going to make it. The, the, the amount of trauma, the, 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 what has happened to him is that he can't recover from. And, of course, he was right.